So now here we're going to talk about the on-bit standard and, uh, and does it belong in specs. I'm hoping it'll be a pretty good conversation. Uh, a little bit of background on me. Uh, I work for Pelco uh, as my day job, but I also sit uh, on the OnBIF communication committee. Uh, actually, I chair the committee, so pretty passionate about open standards and, um, and trying to push um, greater acceptance and use of OnBIF um, out in the industry. Um, I want to start the session off by going through just a couple of uh, background slides on OnBIF. Actually, show of hands, who here is super familiar with OnBIF, knows everything that there is to know? Okay. All right. Who doesn't know anything about OnBIF? Okay. All right. So everybody else is in between. All right. So we'll go through the first section pretty quick, um, and then we'll uh, we'll open it up to our three illustrious um, uh, panelists. Um, maybe actually before we get going, just do a quick introduction of everybody. Um, Greg, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Greg from CHF in Syracuse, New York. Um, I head up one of the security divisions of our group. Good morning, I'm James Marcello with Access Communications. Uh, I head up our technical services uh, team out of Chelmsford, and I also run our industry association program. And Sean Vail, I'm with Burns McDonald, an electrical engineer out of our uh, Minneapolis office, and I specialize in uh, security and communications, uh, consulting in the uh, airline critical infrastructure and DOD spaces. Okay, great. So, um, I'll try not to bore you too much with slides, but just um, a, a couple of uh, background slides on on, on but I think is good. So our stated uh, mission and vision. Uh, so our stated mission is to promote, uh, to provide and promote open interfaces to the security industry. Our vision is that all security uh, systems share one interface. Now we have that vision, fully recognizing that that one interface may not ultimately be on with, but that's where we drive all of our activities. Right? We want to drive a, a, a consistent interface that people can use so you've got all those baseline communication problems solved and you can focus on really innovating and providing uh, market relevant solutions. Uh, I think this group is probably very familiar with the emergence of standards. Uh, I think in this industry, the message is loud and clear. Um, connecting to a potential to an IP network is kind of table stakes. Um, and in so in having connectivity to an IP network, there are uh, there's a need to kind of standardize the way that we communicate and the way that we exchange information um, on that system. Um, there's a lot of different devices. Um, you have you know, access control, you have video, um, but more and more, what we're really seeing is the the power of the analytics. What you're doing to connect all of that information, what you're doing to analyze the relationships of all of that information. So that we're making it. Again, much more important to, to get the table stakes, get all the information into the system, and then to be able to um, elevate the, the solutions um, based on the data that you have. Um, ultimately, full utilization of standards is going to really allow us to achieve true IoT uh, openness and, uh, and interoperability. I don't know if anybody was in the, uh, yeah, I see a few familiar faces from the cybersecurity session yesterday. We talked a lot about interoperability versus integration. Um, this uh, standards play a really, really key role, um, and OnBIF is trying to help um, a lot in that area. Uh, benefits of standards, um, again, I think a lot of this um, I wouldn't get much argument from this crowd. Um, increased flexibility, um, freedom of choice for, uh, for end users, uh, but also for the consultants designing systems, right? Um, if you can pick kind of the best of breed or the right components, um, and, and you know that throughout the life cycle of a product, you can potentially swap out components and pull in um, new innovative product solutions. Kind of gives you some more flexibility, gives you more confidence in the solution that you're pulling together. Uh, so future proof um, and, and secure that investment. Also, uh, more reliable interoperability. One of the things that OnBev um, has worked very hard on since its uh, inception was to really standardize the, the feature level experience that you get when you connect together to OnBev profile compliant devices or, or clients. Um, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I think Ondo had some shaky grounds in the early days, right? There was a, there was a specification and you just said, yeah, I'm Ondo compliant because I'm using aspects of the specification. Um, in, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but in, uh, pretty early on in, in the development of Ondo, the profile concept was discussed. And that was really where you started to state what the specific features and functionality were for various classes of objects within the Ondo specification. So now you don't say that you're 
ONCLIF uh, certified or ONCLIF compliant, you say that you're compliant to a specific profile, which is a set of features and functionality, which sets that baseline level uh, expectation of functionality. Uh, and then you, you can also simplify that whole commissioning and, and installation process, uh, which again saves a lot of money on the front end, uh, but I think also contributes to um, reliability um, and flexibility. So, Onda focuses on three key areas today. Uh, so we have uh, communication between conformant devices and clients. So when you're connecting cameras to um, to VMS systems. So when we say client, we say what's a client of that device, right? Uh, so this could be IP cameras, this could be door controllers, uh, it could be connecting devices into some cloud system. Then we have communication between clients and devices. So this could be that how that VMS uh, software interacts with multiple uh, branded cameras. It could be, again, um, control panels and, and access control management software. Um, and then again, you've got the IoT connections. The system-to-system -system piece is something that we're really just starting to focus on. There are some capabilities there today, um, but I think, again, as you start talking about managing all of those different streams of data that are available on the network, um, talking to the, the various systems that are kind of aggregating their chunks of data and then allowing you to, to pull together all of those data streams and make intelligent decisions is becoming more and more uh, important. So you'll see some, uh, some bigger focus from Onbif on that front um, as we go forward. I mentioned profiles. Um, so there are currently five profiles. Um, the first was uh, Profile S. Focus for Profile S was on that kind of that baseline video um, capability. Uh, in July, we added a new video-oriented profile called Profile T. Um, it adds in uh, advanced video streaming capabilities. That's where we're throwing in H.265. Uh, we have some more um, discussion around uh, analytics and metadata inside of Profile T. Um, the other uh, other profiles, we have Profile Q, which was labeled Q for kind of quick install. This is really also the uh, the first profile that I've had that had some very specific kind of security related aspects to it. Um, I expect we'll get into this discussion um, as we go through today's uh, today's panel, but. Um, I think there's a lot more than that could potentially help influence on the uh, on the cybersecurity side, but right now, um, Q is highlighting those kind of basic communication standards, um, you know, TLS, uh, what levels of encryption, um, HTTPS, things like that. Profile C was our first um, jump it into access control, um, kind of again baseline access control. To be honest, didn't see a whole lot of adoption from that early on. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of issues um, uh, surrounding that. Um, if you you can make, I think, a parallel to uh, where we are with access control now to where Onbif was with video systems when they first started, right? So we're just now starting to dig in to that particular space and manufacturers are, are kind of watching and waiting for maybe those first few dominoes to fall. And then we'll start to see maybe a resurgence in, uh, in access control capabilities. Uh, Profile A um, added in some broader access control configuration capabilities um, and kind of continues our path um, in that space. And then lastly, you have uh, Profile G, which is originally started to focus on edge storage, but it's it's kind of been broadened to just talk about storage in general um, from a, a, a profile standpoint. So those are the, the five profiles we have today. Yeah. So if I'm buying a camera, do I look and see if it could have an S and Q and A next to it? Yes. As logos yeah. or something? That's what you look for. If somebody says that they're on the compliant, that should be a huge red flag. What you're looking for is they're, they're compliant to a specific profile. So you'd see those specific letters. As and there. then there's also numbering too, because I've seen like on with 1.3 and 1.4 or something. So that, yeah, that's that's kind of the distinction. So the numbers are the uh, the profile specific, not the profile, sorry, the, uh, Version. the communication specifications, the protocol specifications. And those are kind of the low level documents that, that itemize out how we, or the language that we use, right? The mutual language that we use between all of the compliant devices. The profiles take that standard and then align it to specific features and functionality that would be expected on devices or clients that, that are compliant to it. Yeah? Uh, how do you uh, get copies of the standards? How was that distributed? Uh, they're all available up on onbev.org. So you don't have to be a member of an organization or something? Do you have to buy them? Um, 
no, we post we post the standards up there. If you want uh, early access to the standards, then you might have no, to. No, no, I mean at the level like we're doing, if somebody's doing specification, somebody yeah, wants to specify a profile Q device, can you know, can some appropriate part of the team, some person on the team get a copy of the King standard. Absolutely. Yeah, anything that's profile. released, you can go up there and look at it. If you if you want to contribute to the ongoing discussion, then, then yeah, there are very that's different levels. Yeah. Um, and if you want to uh, if you want to <coughs> claim compliance to a particular profile, there's a membership level associated with that. But if you want to read the standards for specifications. So is there a published list of the, the of compliant devices? Yes. Is there a place you can go and look up to see it? Yeah. We have a, a search tool up on onbit.org. Um, we actually did a refresh of that this year to make it easier to find specific devices. Uh, and you can search for them you know, by model, by, uh, by manufacturer. Uh, by so model. is this like the Wi-Fi Alliance where you hunt people down and hassle them with a like, claim compliance and they weren't on the list? <laughs> the, there is not necessarily a bad thing. No, there is an aspect of that. Um, we, we do have a way for people to submit false compliance claims to us. Okay. Um, we do, we do some amount of investigation ourselves as well, but when those plans come in, we, we will write cease and desist letters, um, we'll contact people and they kind of do what we need to do there. Uh, I think it's pretty standard in, in any standard organization. And that's, it's actually kind of a good thing. So Onbit has reached critical amount of mass right now that people are trying to spook and pretend that they have certification. So um, we try to keep as close tabs on that as we can. Do all of these profiles have security? Levels built in, security compliance so. so, I'll be honest. I think that's an area where we can uh, we can do some more investigation on. Um, there are some baseline, I think, generally accepted security aspects on them, um, but there's not a specific Onbif security profile. And there's some discussion internally about whether that's something that Onbif should even do. Um, <laughs> so, so in, in the IETF world, 20 years ago, they concluded that every single standard should have a security considerations section. Even if it was really short, it said it doesn't apply here. Yeah. And some would be longer than others. So I think those, those general discussions are happening. What, what the, uh, the conversation is around how far do we take it and uh, how deep do we go as far as uh, leading the way versus absorbing what the manufacturers have already decided, right? And there's a balancing act that we have to deal with. There. Actually, this is a good question for the panel. Uh, maybe James specifically, since you're kind of our, our manufacturer representative. Well, just a question again for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, I was just checking. Uh, <laughs> no worries, it, it was a question about security implications um, within the profile specifications and um, what on with what role should Onbit on be taking to to put forth um, specific security uh, protocols or, or best practices versus having the manufacturers kind of lead that charge? So my my opinion on this, and this is my opinion, um, you know, we have a whole team at Access who represents and works with Onbit on behalf of, of the company, but I would support that idea. I think there are standards in the IT industry from a uh, cybersecurity perspective that could be applied. Uh, and one of the good things about Onbif is it still allows manufacturers to innovate and do interesting things with our products. So just because we're profile uh, S, uh, you know, uh, uh, conforming to that, doesn't mean that we have to stop innovating. We can do some other things that aren't included in that standard. Bringing that back to cybersecurity, we all can do very similar things with edge devices to protect them. So I would see it as potentially being appropriate to include that in OnMIF uh, because there is some innovation going on in cybersecurity out there, right? But the basics, which is what these profiles cover, the basics in cybersecurity is the same for most of these devices. So I can see it being appropriate here. Um, as a consultant, I'd be a proponent of that because there's got to be some some funneling of where we have to look for lines. Mm -hmm. If we get too broad based, we're then we're spending way too much time trying to figure things out with our specifications. Um, the other thing I had noted was with all these compliance requirements, we're finding out in, uh, increase in commissioning organizations that go out and commission systems. They take that away from us in some cases. How do we educate them on verifying compliance operationally? 
and or it's required. The system gets installed, we can prove the paperwork that it's all compliant and not good. How do we know for sure it is after the integrator programs it, tests it, and sends it off to the owner? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. And if, if there's a um, there's a handoff there, right, between when, what, what is the role of the security institution and what's the role of, of the integrator or the person who's actually commissioning the system to perform that full site audit, right? right. Um, I, don't, I don't have a good answer to that. Do you have a question or a comment? Well, uh, I'll let this play out if it needs to. My question's back to his point. I was wondering if you had any apps that if I bought a camera, typed in the IP address, it could tell me which of these which of these levels it is, like some kind of verification test code to run against it. It's not open source you written in Russia. You know, a lot of times you'll find an old camera or something, and you're like, I don't know if I can reuse it. Which OnBiff is it on? Is it up to? Is so, um, I mean, the best thing to do is you can go up to onbiff.org and you can you can search on that the specific model number for that camera, and you'll be able to find what certificates have been uploaded for that document or for that camera. So you'll see what profiles it's uh, it's officially conformant to. You can even download the, the certificate documents and the test reports that were done to, uh, to issue that. Yeah, I'm just asking, can the test process be something that the manufacturers and the and anybody can have access to? So they do today. The, the formal conformant process uh, is that the manufacturers, they, they actually run, uh, there's two tools that we've created in Envoy. A device test tool and a client test tool. Right, so nice. they use those tools right. as a part of their ongoing development, and then they use those tools to create the certificate document that it gets uploaded. Right. Okay. I want to go back to uh, Logan's comment about security compliance. And my question is do you have anyone from IT security or from cyber security sitting in the comedy of Monday to give their input? So it was well in a connected world. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a, a good question. Do we have somebody specifically from cybersecurity or IT security sitting in Um We do have a, a formal permanent working group associated with security in Um And then we've also spun up a use case working group um, that focuses on uh, specific issues in the marketplace. Uh, this is a, a, a new group for us. And their first task was to author a security white paper that talks about how you could, uh, you could apply some of these best practices and they coordinated a lot with those technical experts. Okay. And one more question. If you were to add security compliance to the existing profiles, what would it mean? It means that you will come up with profile S1 or something like that? Or um, it we, we've actually had that discussion internally. What would, it, would it be a modifier to an existing profile or would it be a new profile standalone? Um, I don't think we have resolution to that yet. The, uh, the, the profile approach is that these profiles don't evolve over time. The profile gets launched and then that's the profile. So we don't make changes to profile S. We introduce a new profile, profile T, and that becomes the, the new set of expected functionality moving forward. Um, so there's a couple of ways that we could address it. We could, we could release a new video-oriented profile that includes all of these security-specific things, or we could have just a single security profile uh, and then you just put both letters on any of your performing devices. Yeah? Those two tools that you mentioned that allow you to test on the compliance, I, guess, I assume one simulates a VMS and the other simulates a camera. Are, are those available from, on the website or do you have to be a membership access behind the scenes to get those? Um, I believe you need membership access to get those. Um, I can double check that. Um, they don't. Uh, what they don't simulate um, the VMS or the camera. What they do is they intercept traffic, um, and they validate. Um, well, I guess in some ways maybe they do. They they query the device and they uh, they ask it or interrogate it with specific functionality, and then they monitor what they get back. Um, on the low end, they're essentially using Wireshark to monitor all of the network traffic, and they're validating that the network traffic looks the way it's supposed to in conformance with the spec. Okay. Um, just for the panelists, since there were a lot of questions um, here, um, would you guys find value in having access to the, uh, the device test tool? Uh, do you think that's something that that is is needed for specifications? Maybe start with Sean. I, personally, I don't think I would. Um, I just, you know, for me, this is more of a specifications thing where I, you know, I appreciate having a. Uh, 
compliance body like this that I can depend on that has done that that background. I'm not a one that's going to go out and, and hands-on kind of do my own testing. I guess. So okay. For me, it's I'll wait for the for the specifications to be upgraded and try and keep up with it and keep my specifications up with it. So personally, I wouldn't okay. have that need access. Great. I agree. Um, you get the specs out and understand that the integrators do know that they have to provide client systems. And the one thing that plays into this now with disparate systems, if I have three or four different entities involved in that system, the compliance of the overall system for um, on the compliance okay. would be a question. Okay. James, I don't have anything to add. No. no. Okay. Uh, just just one, one point on that. If you're going to be over, make it well. No matter whether people are using it or not, if you make it open, then yeah, I'll, I'll tell the fact it, it it may be available because I, I do believe it's it's an open source tool. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, you might be able to just download it and compile it yourself. But I'll I'll double check if it's available. Like I said, I think the the membership aspect is really if you want to support if you want to submit a compliance document, you need to be a member to have access. But uh, I'll figure it out. So yeah, they. From the standards world, in modern times, there should be open source implementations of it, and there should be tools to access it that, um, so you can verify things. Because when he specs it, and it goes sideways, and somebody like me comes in and is trying to figure out what went wrong or what went right, or I'm trying to write a good bug report for those fine people to access with their awesome support team, uh, you know, trying to figure this out. Yeah. And also, if you don't have a tool like that, when the attackers build their own tool to try to figure out how to go after this stuff, uh, there's more likelihood they'll find things because there, there's an insufficient variety of, of protocol implementations out there. So this may be early to, to announce, but I think it's, it's very germane to what you just highlighted. Um, one of the things that Onvith is doing is we're, uh, we're setting up kind of an independent challenge program um, that we'll be announcing um, later this year, so I think within the next 30 days. Uh, and it'll run through the early part of next year. We want to get independent software developers to essentially write applications that leverage the Envoy profile specifications. Uh, and then those will be open source and posted so that people can kind of see those examples. Um, and it'll just add to, because of, again, the manufacturers today that are using Envoy might not want to open source their, their code, right? So by leveraging this challenge approach, we can kind of pull together a bigger suite so that people can dig in and really understand what's happening. So could you back up one slide? I just want to make a want to clarify something in my mind. Um, so you made a comment about in that little note on uh, July 2017 profile to advanced video streaming release candidate. You, you, I'm correct in thinking that profile S is always going to be IP video based profile. Yes. It's not going to, you're not changing it because it almost sounded like you were saying that uh, you've issued profile S, it's not going to change again. You would pick a next letter if you were to up, make updates or changes to that profile. But that doesn't seem logical. So did I so, misinterpret that? What's, no. What is profile T potentially going to be? Because it also, I mean, it says advanced video streaming versus IP-based <coughs> video streaming. What would the difference So you could be? potentially have profile S and profile T running on a device. It can be compliant to both profiles. Um, it does It does have a lot of the functionality that Profile S has in it. So in some ways, it's kind of a superset. Um, there are, I, I don't know them off the top of my head, but there are some features that kind of fell out that are, aren't relevant anymore to the marketplace. So you wouldn't just give a Profile S 2.0 type thing? Or not to get not not revised. You don't want to the revs of the profiles. We want to lock them so that you don't have kind of the version chaos to deal with, right? So my, my profile has version one, my profile has version two, and now I'm on, I'm on this manufacturer's firmware version with this manufacturer's software version, and you've got to kind of combine all those things. The, the spirit was to say, and again, the profiles are really just outlining the specific features that need to be available um, in right. the, uh, which are in the product. Ever changing uh, and growing. Right, but when we want to add in new features and functionality, then we'll release a new profile that covers those. You run out of letters. <laughs> yeah, you've got been, 20 left to go here. That, that has been. Discussed. I mean, things like audio, I was wondering how you deal with, like, you know, uh, you, a lot of the cameras have audio associated with it. 
you know, SIP devices, uh, inter IP intercoms, all those kind of things, don't really fit into any of these categories at the moment. So I presume that would be a future profile when you got around to yeah. adding something for those guys. So, so I, I, um, I peppered in a comment about the use case working group. Um, that's one of the, I think that's their chief charter today, is to um, look outside of the organization at the market and what the market is trying to do with IP connected security devices and try to understand kind of what the next area is that Onda should, should pursue to try and help standardize and drive some unified communication with. Uh, and then as they understand that, they build up a formal use case proposal and then they present that back to the organization as something that we can pursue. To date, the way that uh, the way that profiles and specification changes happen is some member looks at a particular problem set and then proposes it to the organization. They get buy-in from I think two or three other manufacturers, and if, if, it's, uh, if it's supported, then we go forward and we kind of develop it. Uh, by its nature, I think a lot of that work has been driven from the uh, technical experts, um, the people who are very familiar with how the code works and how the protocols interact with each other. Um, there hasn't been as much focus on the actual market implementation, the user experience of those profiles. Um, so that's where we're starting to shift now to actually engage audiences like this a bit more uh, so we can, we can pull in some of those next generation things and what can Honda do better to help um, secure facilities, um, help drive specification, things like that. Is Honda compliance required or uh, dictated all by the government DOD specs? I mean, have they adapted it? Is it a feature they want to see? Or is so we have seen um, some locations where we actually are in government uh, in government specs. I believe uh, the UAE is, is doing that in some areas. Um, we are also, uh, this is kind of a good lead into the next slide, we're also not just on with anymore. We're not just pushing our protocols and saying, hey, this is a, this is a great single way for us all to communicate. We work with um, global um, standards organizations. So the, uh, the actual protocol specifications are listed um, with IEC, the International Electro-Technical Committee, um, for video access control and, and CCTV and trains. Uh, we have ongoing discussions uh, with them. We're also collaborating with uh, SIA for OSDP collaboration. Yeah. Loaded question, sorry. I'm on the OSDP committee. I got no idea what you're talking about with that. What is that? Um, so I, we talked about this briefly at ISC West. Um, yeah. But there's, there's discussions going on between um, the, uh, the Access Control Committee and SIA. Okay. But anybody else here on the OSDP committee? Um, that's news to us. Okay, we can get you some more information on that. Um, I think it's a great idea. I'm not disagreeing with doing it. I'm just, yeah. Who owns that committee at SIA? Joe Gittins. Joe Gittins. Yeah. That would be a good question for Joe. I've talked to Joe about this. We, th there's no signal there. Roger that. That's interesting. Okay. That, no, that's good feedback. We've had a discussion on some internal with... Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm on the committee, I wrote the open source thing, I'm doing the conformance tool. I totally think that's a great idea. Okay. So I'm not trying to diss it or anything, I'm just saying, you know, I should have tasked on my task list to help with this. Yeah, I think memorandum of understanding needs to exchange of emails. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it means Don Erickson and your guys talked once. It could be that somebody's had a conversation with you and I just had, and hey, this is a great idea, but then there's no follow-up. <laughs> well, as you're saying, it's a great idea, so we should all execute on more. Right? There's been two conversations. I <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean I get two stickers on my bingo card? <laughs> <laughs> and I will go back and follow up on this, too. Okay, me too. Uh, I'll follow up on the comment about government respects, at least in the DOD side of things, uh, where we use the USGS specifications, if anybody's familiar with those. I haven't seen references to Honda in those yet, but they're not, they're notorious for not being necessarily uh, always completely up to date. Yeah. So another question on the IEC stuff, are you saying IEC 6083-9-11-11-11-1 is an Honda spec, or is that, that is that a committee, or a? That, uh, that spec references the, the other one, idea. Yeah. Pick the wrong one, but yeah. Uh, I, I believe that there's other stuff in that specification, and for the access control specific elements, they've pulled in the on technical spec. 
Okay. So if somebody, said, if the specifier is trying to make sure they put um, uh, standards, uh, standards development organization level of uh, find you know specific thing to say do Wanda, if they could say you know must use IEC six two six seven six dash two dash three colon twenty thirteen. Yes. Or they could write it down and not have to actually say it. No, that we have to teach them to say it really fast because then they sound really You're smart really about it. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the last thing that's not mentioned here, but is, is kind of related to this, is we are also kicking off a, a liaison program so that we can interact with, uh, with members of government organizations who otherwise wouldn't be able to formally participate in an organization like Honda. Um, so that's, that's, I think, going to help tie us into more of these government regulations and government specs to make sure that we're solving problems that are germane to the um, Brief history, uh, and, and I promise we're almost done. Um, I was founded in 2008, a lot of activity um, since then. The, uh, the red boxes, those highlight the interactions that we've had with um, the Electoral uh, uh, Technical Committee um, and, uh, and kind of ratifying those standards on a global level. Um, you'll see the first profile was introduced in 2011. So this is where I highlight, I think, some of the evolution and maturity of Omni. In 2008, we were very focused on the actual profile, uh, or not the, uh, the protocol specifications. In 2011, we realized that that was leaving a gap as far as expected functionality. So that's when we started <coughs> focusing on uh, on profiles. Um, membership has grown pretty steadily um, up through uh, 2015. Now we're kind of hovering um, at, at about 500 members consistently, um, with more than 8,000 conformant products. Hey, uh, John, is PSIA and Omnif still working at cross purposes, or are they looking to uh, combine Sorry. forces, or what's the deal with that? Um, this is a very interesting discussion. Uh, I, I think we are we're no longer kind of butting heads as much as, as we were. I think that uh, that period is past. Uh, we are open to kind of collaborative discussions with them, but I think they're even more in an infant state than the OSDP discussion. We do see that some of the work that they're focusing on now is more complementary to what we're doing than directly competitive. So that's kind of where things sit today. I just don't see a lot from them. Yeah. Right. I think I'll leave it at that. Specific movement in that direction would likely be driven by some market forces indicating that we should right. do something. Uh, so I'll close just by talking about the benefit of, uh, of ONDIF standards. Um, so you can build these kind of service-oriented architectures, replace components um, as needed, separate your configuration and your monitoring aspects, um, and then uh, that, that kind of interdisciplinary capability, right? So we're stepping in access control and video. Should we be doing other things? Should we be looking at, how uh, you mentioned, audio intercoms, uh, other other aspects that ONDIF can kind of help drive communication with. Um, what about BMS? Maybe BMS, yeah. So um, so actually, let's let's open that up to the panel now. I mean, how important would BMS be? From a well, because we're seeing companies bringing out BMS systems in that control, uh, the end or type of systems, very well, the same module may have the HVAC connected this to it. One's doing access control, one's doing cameras maybe, and so there's got to be some compliance, I would think, there, because that those communication routes have to be considered. Mm -hmm. that, that's the same question that you've got with all of the stuff. Is why is there an ONDIF standard? I mean, you've got all this IETF stuff. So what, what, you know, what, what got added on top of it? First rule of writing standards is don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, so you know, it, it, not that I like it, but that would mean that you should have an MOU with BACnet or, or something if it's you know, HVAC kind of systems. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, the world, standards are great, except you don't need nine different versions of things. So like you know, the PSA versus ONDIF, confusion at least, whether or not there's dialogue or negative dialogue is, is, is already a problem. So I don't know if the panel wants to answer, I have a comment on that too though. Go right ahead. Okay, um, I think one of the distinctions is ONDIF's focus is to create kind of a, a standard interface to identify how that communication happens. I think if you were to do something like, like that, uh, we, we, we likely would not build a competitive solution to that, and we probably would reach out to them and say, here's the existing state of the art on how these devices should communicate. 
so the profile would, would leverage calls into that. Um, my, my uh, a pessimist would say, we had HTTP, we had HTTPS, we got XML and JSON and things like that. Why don't you just write an XML DTD and be done? So why do we have an ONPIF standard? Or a set of standards at all? Um, I know that's too big a theological question for this group, but yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, when you, you know you get the thing that you know the the, the rumor is that Nomref never works between two specific devices. I know it's supposed to be better than that now. Yeah. Um, but you know, I it keeps falling off of my task list to try it again because I keep getting you know negative vibes from customers trying to, trying to do this stuff. So you go back to the standards, you know, kind of look view of it, and, and it, it seems quite challenging. And then you get the whole why are we doing another standard? So, but we get this in OSDP also. Is why didn't we do another standard? So it's a it's a challenge where everybody has to work with. Yeah, it it's not clear to me how the the XML piece would be better either, right? So I mean that's pre-existing standards. It's, it's not better. It's already there. It's already there. Yeah. But the the point of the uh, point of Andre, like I said, is to is to kind of leverage those standards and corral them into a, a specific set of, of actions and, and how you communicate. So we're not, I mean, we're not redeveloping XML. We actually, we do leverage XML as part of the Ondo standard. So maybe there's a, I'll, I'll throw this out there. Maybe it is wrong to look at Ondo as a standard organization. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you look at that, in that same context. You know, maybe it's a publisher of profiles of how to leverage existing standards or something. Yeah. something. It's, a, that's it's, a, more it's a higher level of discussion, okay? Yeah. yeah. I think it goes back to the manufacturers. So if it's not a standard, why manufacturer would you know, look at it? And I will tell you from being a manufacturer working in a VMS company, we had a lot of problems with a lot of cameras. You have to support 4,000, 6,000 different cameras. So now you have a standard that cleans all that. It's very much needed. Maybe to some other manufacturer it's not, but it, it solves a lot of problems. And, and, and if, you don't have the major stakeholders coming in and creating that standard, people will not jump on board. That, that's one of the problems that you have in the market now. Yeah. On the other hand, I was on the PSA board, and over there, the access control manufacturers, the big ones, they were the ones who were driving it because they had their own issues of compliance between one panel to another. They wanted to solve that. And that's why PSA came. Now, whether it is Competing with on it or it's um, adding to on I think that both of them are. Well, his, historically, it seems to be an awful lot of challenges with both of those sort of things. Yeah. I've been doing standards, so let's see, the earliest standard I ever touched was the 1976 X25 standard, so I've been doing it that long. So watching standards organization come and go, I was around when they did the thing before HTTPS, it was SHTTP, and that died partially because the standards organization was set up wrong. So when we watch these things, there's a maturity model for standards processes. On the, you know, they were flying pretty rough for a while there. I guess it's getting better. Um, you know, in PSA, a lot of people would say it's still flying pretty rough. Um, so the, the uh, you know, why is it there? Why do we need new standards? Is it working? How come I can buy a camera with 10,000 features on him, of which four of the features work with OnDiff, and the rest I have to go back to the proprietary interface? That's an old comment. I'm not claiming it's like that in today's world. Um, so this is the, the sensitivity. Well, you know, it kind of doesn't really work. You may not be playing against that today, but is that different today? Is it different today? And so my, you know, this is part of why I'm interested in this, is that it was, it, it was really bad uh, three years ago or so, the last time I put in the effort in trying to look at Ondiv, and I've been trying to listen to find more positive feedback to go look at these things. So, I mean, that's why I think it's great that you did this thing here, and I don't need to be dissing it. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to try Cornflex again for the first time. Uh, you know, so like Profile Q sounds wonderful, although I've heard bad things about what's in it. And I haven't bothered to read it because I haven't had a business case to read it yet. Okay. So, so Rodney, there's still exactly what you described out there. So the Profile S is a base set of interfaces. It does it not cover everything in Axis cameras or Sony or Panasonic or Hanwha. It still leaves the gives the manufacturers the ability to innovate. And there's, there's just, all the standards that are, that are healthy. Have the, we have to make sure that companies can innovate inside that framework. That's sort of the old, that, that's a table stakes kind of comment. But the, you can use Omdiff or you can use my 10,000 features, one or the other is the kind of thing we used to see. Uh, yeah. And so that, that's the, you know, the, the system was games to screw you if you used Omdiff and you, if you really wanted the good features, you'd go back to the vendor specific stuff. That, that's not, 
That's vendor lock-in. That's not diversity. And, well, and not a facility to, pursue, to let you have any Yeah, yeah. I think you know, the comment on the VMS side and, and the benefit of having this, this one potential driver to write to for multiple manufacturers is, is really, that's where the real benefit of all yeah. of this is for and, and that's manufacturers. But yeah. at the same time, um, so, so I run a support department. And I can tell you that I can judge and I know what are successful features of our products based on the number of calls we get. The more calls we get, I know it's a popular feature. And that's just simply because we sell so many cameras that people need help configuring it, right? If I don't get calls on something, I know that that's not a used feature. Um, we don't get calls on OnFIF. Um, I can remember a handful of calls that we've gotten. So OnVIF, I think, at this point, has become a, a almost a checkbox on specifications because people want a security blanket and say, I know I can leave this manufacturer and go to somebody else if I need to. But even if you do, so if you, if you rip and replace access out of an installation, most likely you're going to put in another, what I would call, reputable manufacturer, one of, one of the big ones, right? Guess what? That VMS already has support for their native drivers. So, the so, so it, it just it rolls in, and, and again, OnVIF doesn't get used in that Well, case. the problem is that also could happen if it never works, and therefore I wouldn't bother to file a bug report with it. I mean, an example yeah. is I've been spending eight years yelling at camera vendors and put TLS in them, and nobody has yet said, dude, Profile Q covers it. You should go read the profile. Nobody said that to me yet. Um, I'm not sure it does. I have, it does. I, I, my, I've heard it does badly, actually. Um, but, tell us how it's bad. Uh, I heard it only does self signed certificates. I haven't read it, so I'm now talking about a spec I haven't read. I don't need to do yeah, that. No, no, I get you. Um, yeah. uh, I want to add something to the VMS discussion and uh, on this. So, if you look at legacy VMS manufacturers, why they have all the drivers for all the cameras, right? Now, that vendor wants to come up with a new VMS. Okay? And he has a choice. I need to come up with the support for at least a certain amount of existing customers that I have with the existing different cameras that I have, and I have to come up with a new version. I can't cover everything on my first release, or my second release, or my third release. I'm releasing a new product. So how can I support a variety of cameras, right? That's what they use the, the only because that's the only choice that they have. So to the IT folks, that sounds like a 1980s level of engineering. I mean, the, the idea of meeting a vendor who can say, I have X thousand integrations, that's broken. You know, it's like people don't say they have X thousand versions of their IP, you know, their Cat5 cable connector in the back of their camera. Uh, so so the, I, you know, yeah, I totally agree with that, but the, you know, it would, it would be good if we had you know, one or some small number of interfaces we could, we could all worry about. Uh, but the, yeah, we, I mean, the, the idea of a product yeah, with Because the problem is also, think about it, all the existing big players that are in the market, it's like there is a block. No new place can come so in that's because why, of that issue. That solves it. This solves it, yeah. And, and the, the, again, the IT view is basically all the big players are broken because they're still chasing the old model. But I, which but I which is a radical comment, except when I got the CIO asking me to figure out what to buy, then I'm supposed to, I'm sorry, I'm the messenger. I'm supposed to give you the radical comment. But I, 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 don't, I don't think it's, when you look at the profiles, if I take a definition of a specific profile, I don't think it's this easy. Because I, I've been on the manufacturing side for a long time, you know, a couple of, of good-sized companies, and I, I very distinctly remember that part of the design process. So, so a, a standard can't dictate the secret sauce that one vendor versus another versus another uses that allows them, that gives them the competitive edge, that gives them the technology edge, that that makes a better picture, does whatever the, the buzzwords are that go to the market. The, the challenge I think the, the, that I have, and I, I'm kind of asking the consultants of them, the, the challenge that I have in supporting what we do um, as a manufacturer versus what the ONVIF standard seems to be two different pieces. And I, I view the ONVIF standard as the worst case of I need to be able to connect this to here. There's a common protocol that I can make it happen. The frustration that I have is that from a manufacturing side, and, and not only as access, but my previous company, we spent a lot of time working specifically with the other players in the industry, the VMSs and, and all of the other partners that are out there, to get our technology forward to say, is there anything that you need to do to make sure that the API, standard API, 
which is essentially the, the way to interface that anything that you need to do to change to adapt to the secret sauce that we have. And, and I, I, I'm a little frustrated because I know from the manufacturing side that we spend a lot of time, a lot of money on the APIs and the open communication to talk to all of our partners that are out there. And then, you know, then we say, oh, well, yeah, we're OnBIF compliant as well. And it, it seems to us that the, the OnBIF is something that is mandatory, and I get it and I respect what they have done, but I also somewhat challenge that in that as a specification writer, is that really, is that really where you start? Because most of the time when you're working with the, the ecosystem out there, the API drivers are already written. You know, we're already talking to those. So do we really want to lose some of the secret sauce and the things that makes my product unique or your product unique or whatever it is? We want to lose that because we want to go with the on standard. And I think that's a challenge. Why, so why you can't it? standardize the secret sauce that companies have. So I, I just, I don't know how you all view that. Why does it have to be an if this or that and not a both? Uh, well, because that's it seems the, like the whole point of having content in the first place is to provide a stable um, platform of all of these various options and abilities. And if a camera has that option, it would be done in this way. And if it doesn't, you would skip it. Um, and so when you have your 200 various options and Onbit has 10 in, in their profile um, that deal with it, those 10 would be on the and all the other ones would be dealt with in the API. Yeah, and a properly done standard would facilitate you doing that. So let's say you make up an access specific H265 variant that's really quite different. You know, you'd want to have a standards environment that supports negotiating that kind of thing, and then you could choose to go to this other dialogue. So it's, it shouldn't be an either, either or. Oh, um, but that, that's a great example with, you know, what we call Zipstream, what our competitors call something else, right? It's a variant of 264 compression. Right. It is not in the Envid standard, but as, as a client, as a designer, or as a client, we're pitching that hard because we know that there are drastic savings in that with the storage. Yeah, and, and, and you get these little cloud but, red flags that you had to pitch that to the IT world um, because that sounds like proprietary stuff, and we kind of matured out of that. We're all running TCP IP now. Well, but, but not necessarily because when you look at when you look at the different capabilities of, and I'll use ours as a zip stream. There, there are multiple levels, right? So the first level is it does a little bit. Uh, it would work if you just plug it into your system. It's going to give you a little bit of savings if you turn on the very low because there's nothing that has to happen on the back side to understand what we're doing to that particular compression screen. As you start to get ratcheting up and really start pushing that technology, that interface, the VMS or the, the, the decoder has to understand what we're doing. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. So, that, so my, we're talking about two different things. I'm saying that the standards, and, and again, I'm talking off the standard that I haven't read the details of, so I don't need to misquote it. Um, looking at you like you're the, you're the poster child for it. Sorry. Uh, you guys. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, 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 the standard should facilitate doing this and switching into that mode. Or, I mean, it's the equivalent of plug and play. Or in the SNMP world where you have standards. They, so you have, there's some standard MIBs about things like Ethernet frames. And if you go look at, for example, Cisco, there's like 10,000 more SMP MIBs about their specific features. If you have a 4500 switch and you want to know if the left blade is going to blah, 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 they come up with it. They can, there's a mechanism to talk about going into that proprietary mode. So they're not different. They shouldn't be different things. They all should be on this. Even if what you do in on this is decide to suddenly say, I go into the super cool feature mode that you should be. But I think that's, that's very important, right? I mean, it's, it's understanding what the, what the potential handoff is between the stuff that's standardized and then the secret sauce that the manufacturer has. Yeah. To me, that's the strength of Envif. To your, your original question, Jeff, is about how it affects specification writing. And to me, about half of my specifications have to be non proprietary So I have to be able to put as much mean in there, but I can't say Zipstream. Zip I can say H.264 or 265, but I can't say the specific yeah. secret sauce part because I have to have you compete against everybody else. Um, so to have an Envif in there is a good platform to start your specification from that gives you minimums. But then I'm going to add things like H.264 or 265 or other things that I want everybody to have. But that's the problem is when we have to write government, DOD, or, or competitive specs, we have to write them in such a way and we have to stay as generic as we can and not show our hand that you know we're really based on the spec on axis. But I have to say H.264, I can't say this. So, 
So just to take the question out to the consultants uh, out there, how many of you actually have customers that are using OnBIF to record, to, to get video streams to record? Zero. Not that specific. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is exactly what I'm talking about in that specification security blanket checkbox type of thing. This is what I've seen with regards to that. I, agree. I don't find many people, again, we don't get phone calls about OnBIF. And uh, that does not necessarily mean that it works perfectly because we don't get phone calls. We don't get phone calls because it's not being used it, right now. Remember, one of our goals is in, in the competitive side of things when you're in competitive bidding market and a non proprietary spec, our goal is to minimize the players to the higher quality tiers. And we have to do that without saying your name specifically or anything, right? right? So anything we can do to kick a few of the low players off the list, and, and at least they're going to still try, but I can at least say because of these 10 things, you don't comply. And, and that gets yeah. back to my original comment of if, in fact, you do kick out one of those top tiers, you're probably going to pick another top tier right. custom company. And that top tier is going to already be supported with their native API in the VMS because it's one of the top tier. Because to your point, on all of my other uh, what I call proprietary specs for a specific client that already has a VMS and already, let's say, Access is already is already standardized on Access Camera around their entire enterprise, I specifically write Zipstream and all that stuff in there. Because they've standardized on it. I don't even have to write Onboard in there. I can write every specific thing from your cut sheet in the spec because that's their standard. It's only in the not proprietary spec side that I have to utilize the checkbox yeah, so and the safety security blanket. So that's the elephant in the room, right? I mean, what what does OnBIF need to do to compel you to put it into a spec? And then maybe the, the, the follow-up to that is, is it even relevant? And, and well, put it up, but you're talking you're talking with a group, I think, that's that's when you look at the segment segmentation of the market, you're you're looking at more of the enterprise side, right? So so I, I wonder as 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 you start to go down into the to the small medium and all that, I, I wonder as you go down, on with gains more relevance. But you know, in in the community that I work in, which is really more of the, the high mid to enterprise class, I don't think my opinion is I don't think Omnif really matters that much. So you're proposing that the manufacturers they've already they're playing at that high end, they've already everyone's already interface APIs together. together, right? But I think yeah. as you start to drop down into other tiers where it becomes more of a commoditized market, mm -hmm. that's where it's it's necessary, where someone can go and say, Oh, under this, under this, well done. If you have to write a K twelve spec, which is there's no money in the project and you know the trunk slimers all over the place are going after that because can't stop them. You can't say who gets to bid on that public school. Yeah. Omniv can be in there. Yeah. Right. You can try and get some of that, some of that lower tier people out of there, so you can at least give your client a, a certain minimum level of quality. But you're right. When you're talking about enterprise class, most of those clients have standardized on either one manufacturer or two or something. Where then I don't have to even talk about. Them. So my experience recently, like the last 18 months, is that the larger enterprises are getting more and more militant about demanding that things get done with standards. So I, I, I believe it's that way now. I think it's I think in the, going forward people are going to expect more standardization. And the, you know that's very nice that you know we've been using milestone for the last three hundred years in this site. Uh, but they're going to start actually asking about standards based stuff. I, I think I think that it might not be as relevant for camera specification as it is for the VMS specification though. So you know from an access standpoint it'd be different than from a mile standpoint. From a telco standpoint <clears throat> Full sides of ours being on VIF makes us a, makes us a, a, a better fit in case the, the the bidders are trying to bid some other camera like a Samsung or some other camera into the system, and we want to make sure that the VMS that we get part of the, the job, not maybe the whole job, but we're there in the in, you know in in the running for at least the head end. So, so to that point, back to the panel. What is, what's your perception about how seriously manufacturers take on the, we talk a lot about the market and maybe some different dynamics there and where it's getting deployed, but what's I, your perception? I, I can talk from, from an access perspective. Uh, I think we're getting better at that. Um, and I want to just relay a, a, a pretty humorous sort of story around our, our implementation of Profile S. Um, when we first did that, 
uh, the cameras that we had at the time, I think the, the highest resolution was 4 SIF. So we created a profile around 4 SIF. Well, four or five years later, when we have 720, 1080, 4K, guess what? The profile that you're pulling is still 4 SIF. <laughs> and we had people calling us and saying, I go to the camera with my web browser and I see this beautiful 720p video stream, but then when I pull it through Profile S, it looks like hell. What's going on here? We didn't have a way in our product to change the profile. And we started getting support calls about that. And those are the support calls that I remember because somebody had an Vigilon system for the VMS but wanted to use access cameras for the camera. But the quality of the image coming in because the the request for that, that stream profile from the camera was based on a 2011 model that we never updated. So that was kind of a wake-up call for us internally as, hey, we need to start looking at this and taking this a little bit more seriously. Now you can go into the camera interface and define what your on diff profile S will look like from a video stream perspective, resolution, frame rate, compression level. But we didn't have that before. So when you say how serious are the manufacturers taking it, that's a great sort of story to say we needed to take it a lot more seriously. Yeah. Um, and, and we have been. Uh, and we've done a much better job since that. It, it was a wake-up call for us. And that was simply because the engineers at the time, this was the best that they could do. Yeah. And then nobody kept an eye on the ball. Awesome. But again, that just goes back to points to nobody was using it. So if people were using it, we would have figured that out a lot sooner than three or four years after. Also from a manufacturing engineering standpoint, the, the use of that, of Onvith S, becomes much more uh, cost effective for us to be able to not have to engineer to every API out there in the world. Yeah, that's the whole benefit. Yeah, that's the whole benefit. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that is the, that's the holy grail of what Onvith stands for. Right, and, and it's really the holy grail for VMS at, at the end of the day. And it is a good thing for end users if it's being used. And that leads into the end users, depending on his integrator, to know about how to, how to turn these on and off the program. Yeah. Does he? Mm -hmm. How do we get them educated? If we can specify the heck out of it, you can manufacture it. If the owner, if the owner wants it, knows it exists, how it's supposed to improve it. For that integrator, person maintaining all the IT department, do they know enough about to be able to turn things on? Get software, get firmware updates. How do they get them? How do they them in? That's a whole other. And that's something Onbit has been looking at. Sorry, but I mean that exact point, right? I mean, we're in some ways we, we're uh, we're like a we're like a manufacturer who isn't doing a good job at connecting with the customer base and explaining how to use the product, right? People don't even know how valuable it is because we're not getting the message out there. We've done a lot this year to kind of amp up our communication and outreach. So we're, we're getting more awareness out there and we're seeing some of those stats pick up. Uh, but I think there's certainly more to come there. Yeah. So there is work to try to get I, 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 I didn't realize that it was you selected on VIPS setup or your API setup. I thought your API was on VIP client no. for the items no. that dealt with yeah. that's, that's, that's the that's the identified in on VIP. Uh, so when, you connect, when you connect to the camera, yeah. you have to select the connection via on or via yeah. 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 Or you can use Vapex from Access or whatever yeah. uh, Sony says. So I mean, that, is, that is a manufacturer of choice. Okay. So yes. I guess I if, I, if I put it on my other pad, yeah. <laughs> the way that the, way that the, the Helco API is set up now is we're, we're actually retiring the Helco API and we're going with an on the first right. approach. Because we want to, we want to leverage all of those benefits, and we want to force ourselves to implement the best version of Onda. So, is the yeah. profile T that we're looking at the advanced stuff going to take into account all the various analytics and uh, other, you know, set of information that has been left out of? So, so I'll be careful to say has when, when you when you make a. a Grand statement about all of the analytics. Yeah, okay. I have to give the answer no, right? It's not going to cover everything, uh, but it does cover a lot of the analytics space. Again, for those who are using the single stuff of analytics, it may cover it. For those who want the specific feature or capability of either yeah. an access camera or a third party analytics, you we'll probably have to dig into that specific yeah. feature. Yeah, that's usually how I pick the cameras. I find this feature set I'm after, and we're using that camera because it has these particular 
features that I want to... Right, but if I'll tell you, for example, that tomorrow, Milestone, Genentech, OnSSI, Belco, and others will come up with a version that supports only OnPrif. That's a major shift in the industry. Everybody will have to move to use OnPrif, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody will, be on, will have to be on board. Now, another thing that I want to say, going to your comment for me earlier, I think that if IT will force more rules and, and, and clicks about commissioning the system in, 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 on the customer side, because what's happening today, and I've seen it a lot of times, whenever it comes to video or VMS and cameras, the IT guys are stepping, stepping aside. And they either get a saying, don't touch my servers, don't put any security policies on those servers because that's video, we don't touch it. And it's kind of left, left that, side. That was, that was last week's version. This week's version is that we realized we had, we had this IoT fear thing now, and right. it's mapped into cameras, whether the cameras are bad or not. Some suck, some don't. Um, so the, the, uh, you know, it, it's getting more so they're, they're involved with it. Um, you know, in the good organizations, they'll embed an IT person in the physical security group so we don't have these communications issues. But it, it's getting so they care more and more. So like one, of, one of my takeaways from this is that I should go figure out if use, I could use Profile Q to, uh, in, as, an, as an IT person looking, trying to say, can you go with this profile? Because right. it, would, it would likely set up a bunch of things the way we're trying to ask you. Um, so we're trying, trying to, I, I think IT can leverage this stuff. Right. 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 And, and your, to your point about to get educating the customer, so when, when you get more and more IT folks in the room, so this is the, you know, I don't have to know what your tech is, but when you tell me you've got 300 integrations, I can tell it's broken. Uh, because you've got multiple integrations. So, you, so there are some metrics which the customers are learning to figure out how to look at with these things. And, and then it does, once you get that kind of characters in the room in the, in the um, procurement process. So when you, when you guys are evaluating manufacturers, do you, uh, do you look at how they deal with standards? How they, how they manage connectivity as a, as a metric? I'm looking at more quality control support, uh, availability, uh, field support, than the metrics of connectivity. Okay. I'd be camera to me is going to talk to a switch, talk to a VMS. And another thing is we talk about all these great features and benefits, and the customer wants them. I don't think half of our customers know about all these features and benefits, and that and all the metadata we're sending back and forth. It's very really intelligent. IT department that's you know, just got all that savvy and understanding, but sometimes you over overdo this. So trying to find out which manufacturer has all the bells and whistles, all these amazing things, you can money the water. Because your video may not be as great as this guy's, um, or there's an issue with the operation of the head end, the BMS. So um, I think sometimes you have to get back to basics and make sure that your support's there, your warranty replacement's <coughs> there, your field support's setting up because I'll say 80% of, of the integrators don't know about this stuff. They don't have a clue. In, you know, you know to, to that point, um, you know, one of the things that I think on this potentially not harms but, but hinders is it, it almost creates you know this perception of equality across all manufacturers because I can I can be a startup from somewhere. And I can have zero presence in the United States. I can have no support. Um, I only do email support, and maybe I check that every couple of days, right? But I'm on with S profile, right? So now I'm put in the same category as somebody uh, who has all of these things, right? Just because I have that. And I think people quickly find that out and get around that, particularly with the first time they get burned, right? They don't go back to that manufacturer. But there's, there's that one potential issue there. You know, back to your original point, uh, Ronnie, I was, I've been thinking about this. I remember when, when we first started talking about OnDev, and people were saying there's no standards in our industry, I, coming from an IT background, was like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, we're using standard protocols in the IT industry to serve this stuff up. Well, then so that, that was my, why do we have, you know, yeah, the, your it, HTTP and your RTS exactly. and we're done. And so, so and, and that's exactly how I looked at it. But then when you talk to physical security people, they, they said, yeah, but the way I get an image from a Sony camera is different syntax than how I get it from an Axis camera, from this camera, from that camera. And that's what this is. This is just making it simple so that you don't have to memorize or know the syntax for each different camera manufacturer, despite the fact that it's all HTTP, for instance, right? right. Because to me, HTTP is the standard. 
Yeah, and so just what you actually type in, uh, you know, isn't a standard. That's just what, that's how you're getting it. I mean, a better way to look at it is yeah. um, if you look at how email works on the internet, there's the low level IP packets and all that stuff, and then right. there's SMTP, and there's how do we do DNS so we have anti spam, and there's a whole bunch of layers and layers and layers on top of it. So this is providing sort of, if you look at the ISO protocol model, this is providing um, value with the upper layers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, so even though we're all talking IPv4 or v6 packets. So yeah. to bring this back to the IP side and your comment that IP is getting, in some cases, more militant about making sure that you're following standards. I think when the IT actually looks underneath the hood, they're like, oh, this is an IP device that does HTTP. And uh, oh, I can lock it down in these ways, great. Or I need to do this, that, or the other thing. So, And, and then you go look at the fancy schmancy camera from Axis and discover it doesn't really do all that stuff with OnDiv. And then you go to Amazon and figure out if you set your, your search criteria to under $100 camera, comma, yeah. shipped from China in three weeks, everybody does OnDiv. So, so on, on that topic, though, I mean, <laughs> I think we, we have to be careful about what we're, what the standard says, right? The, the standard says this device will communicate using the same language, right? Leveraging, leveraging the, the lower level standards, uh, but putting an umbrella language across those, right? It doesn't say anything about the quality of the implementation of the features on those products. And so, so use an analogy of Bluetooth headsets. There's a Bluetooth standard, and Bluetooth actually uses different profiles as well to define the capabilities of those Bluetooth devices. But you can buy a $10 Bluetooth headset or a $200 Bluetooth headset, right? Uh, so I think, and that goes back to the discussion we had earlier about just because you're on Biff doesn't mean that you've leveled the playing field and there's no more secret sauce and there's no more competitive right. edge. There's, there's people who believe that, though. That's that, that, that's that's a perception thing. Yeah. Yeah. The, integrator the, who's buying, the integrator who's buying it says, Broke yeah. all this, I got it, I can spend on this one now, and it's you know, 100 bucks versus 200 bucks. Yeah. And then, and then when we can that integrator for the next job, we bring in another one who actually at least can spell S. So I don't know if other, other BMS manufacturers that have this, but Axis has our own BMS, ACS, right? We actually have an OnDiv compatibility tool. So, you know, just because it says it's on my, uh, OnDiv Profile S, which we support in ACS, does not necessarily mean that it's actually going to work. So you have to use our compatibility tool to make sure that it will. Uh, so I don't know if other manufacturers do that uh, as well, other BMS manufacturers, but um, it, it almost begs the, the question of if it's on with Profile S, why do we have to go through this compatibility tool? Um, but not everybody actually implements the same level. Yeah, well, I think they're going to get too. Or rotate the image. Or rotate. He's been very patient yeah. with that. Yeah, I was going to say. We have a lot of. Um, People who implement OnViv seem to do their own flavor yep. of OnViv. So you'll have OnViv, OnViv Profile S, but until you actually test it, it may or may not actually work in your BMS. Um, and, and this is more applicable to the less expensive Chinese cameras, that, that kind of thing that you run into. So we do have a tool also for that. It's not very pretty. It's not designed for public consumption with a big pretty GUI on it and everything. But we do have a tool and utility that can be used to verify that this camera is going to behave the way we expect it to. Milestone, and it's gonna the video is gonna come appropriately. You can have an expectation that this would be certifiable on the product. Yeah, ours is it's very simple as well. It's not the, yeah. so. Are you, are you guys talking about tools that end users can or, or integrators can get their hands on? It's it's more intended, I think, for the camera manufacturers to verify and test yes. that it's gonna work right with the cameras, but. Um, but yeah, they're not. They're definitely not pretty up for public consumption. Well, I don't. I don't need. I don't need pretty. I need to unwind the finger point. <laughs> if, if it's so sideways, I'm in the room. It's okay if it's a rough tool. And how do we have to solve this during the interview process? Get that performed. That's so what, there are practice. consultants out there. So my market is actually the consultants, and then the other people. So I get, I, you know, the consultant will call me and say, "Well, you go try this camera with Profile S, and when the smoke comes out, tell me what color it is." You know? Or, and, and so we, I, would, I would use those tools, and then if it didn't work, that facilitates me like filing bug reports in an appropriate manner or something. Yep. Should Onvif build a tool for the public consumption for compliance like they have for the manufacturers? So the, the, so the, the consultants can, can, at the end of the job, they can you know, certify that it's a, you know, that everybody's camera that was put on, regardless of who it was, complies with OnViv, 
and and all the different <laughs> files that may be there because now you've got G and Q and S and upcoming T and you know on and on and on. We used, uh, that, we used earlier too because during submittal, once it's installed, it's done. Yeah. It's good enough. Hold on, hold on. The VMS is a major role because yeah. when they say they support a specific camera with an open contrast profile, their responsibility is to bring the camera into the lab, test it with a specific firmware from the, the camera manufacturer, and then after they certify it, they have to publish on their website under the support of devices which device it is, what version, what is the firmware, and what profile it supports. And you can go, you're supposed to go to the VMS that you're using, go to a website and check that, that camera is being supported. Because you can have a variety of cameras with a variety of film models that some of them are supported, some of them are not supported. I can also tell you that the process of testing, let's say that you have under a specific family of that camera manufacturer 15 cameras, the VMSs usually don't test those 15 cameras. Why? Because it's the same film. So they will test only one or two cameras, if it's a real camera, a PVC camera, and then they will say it's certified. Now from this point, when you are going to decide and you're getting a version of a camera with a new firmware, it's most likely not being tested. So you're the first one who's testing. So that's what you need to, to make sure when you are specifying something as a consultant, that you're doing your own work with those VMSs. With those All right, yeah. so uh, I think we're getting close to time. So I want to kind of wrap things up. I think this has been a great conversation. I want to close with uh, a small plug, I think, for Onba. So a lot of the topics that came up here, uh, I think are things that we at Onba want to be um, having more of an open discussion about. Um, so I mentioned, I think, a couple of times during the presentation portion of this that we have started an Onba um, use case working group. That group is focused on connecting with, with people like you and pulling in some of that stuff that Onba as an organization could do better to, uh, to help with specifications to help drive discussions, to help work better with manufacturers. Um, as a part of their efforts, we're going to start rolling out various focus groups. Uh, so if anybody is open to kind of carrying the passion from this room forward and having some of those discussions with Onda, uh, you know, please see me or, or reach out uh, either today or after the show. Uh, we'd love to pull that conversation in and then see what we can do to continue the evolution. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.